Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you, and welcome back to Now TV and Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. I do so much appreciate you being with me, uh, joining here, joining me every Friday morning, and uh, sharing with me, pardon me, insights uh, into the Word of God having to do with Bible prophecy. And I hope that the lessons that I am bringing you are an encouragement to you. And, and by the way, uh, I'm just so thrilled when I hear from some of you uh, who tell me that an understanding of fulfilled eschatology has given you such comfort, uh, such assurance in the future that although the external world uh, it's sometimes very, very frightening. Now, look, we all know that the world that we live in is a pretty cruel place. It's very often unjust. We see immoral uh, immorality everywhere around us. We see political corruption everywhere around us. But listen to me. Uh, in fact, just the other day, I, I went in to mail off some books, and, you know, uh, this was right after the uh, the assault on the White House in Washington, D.C. And, of course, that was frightening. It was terrible. It was uncalled for. Uh, it should never have happened. But all of that aside, I went in and, to, the, uh, to the shipping center, and the woman who runs it, she was processing my order, and finally she goes, Don, uh, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she goes, Okay, where are we? What in the world is going on? Now, she was very obviously deeply troubled by what she was witnessing on her television, in the news, as well she has every right in the world to be upset about that. But you see, so many people approach that, and they say, well, things like this, they are a sure sign that we're in the last days. The, 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 the end of human history is at hand. No, these things do not prove that the end of human history is at hand. You see, the common assumption is, obviously, that the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, is an earth-burning, time-ending event. It is the end of human history. What I've been sharing with you for well over a year now, year and a half almost, is that the, the concept of the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, this, what we call the second coming, that concept which says that one of these days, and of course our dispensational friends say, oh, well, you know, just any day now, uh, it, uh, it's just, it's got to be upon us. Of course, uh, anyone who has studied biblical prophecy at all knows that the dispensationalist in virtually every generation has said, oh, wait, this is it. This has got to be it. And on Facebook over the last few days, I've been reading posts by people, and, and they're not really even dispensationalists. And yet they nonetheless say, the end for us is very, very near. The coming of the Lord is very, very near. <clears throat> well, folks, those predictions have proven false for 2,000 years. And as I have been sharing with you here on Now TV, the skeptics, the unbelievers, the atheists, the agnostics, the infidels, the Muslims, and the Jews all tell us the fact that Christ hasn't come by now is proof positive that Jesus failed. He was a liar. He was a false prophet. No, it does not prove any such thing. What it does prove is that the church, for way too long now, has adopted this literalistic, hermeneutic, that when he talks about Christ coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, with the angels a shout, in fire, etc., etc., that has to be Jesus coming as a five-foot-five Jewish man in a physical body. 
I interact with people with that expectation on Facebook virtually every single day. But I'm telling you, it just doesn't work. And listen, if you want a little inexpensive book that addresses the nature of the coming of the Lord. Now, I've written almost 34 books, okay? Uh, I'm finishing up on another book right now. But if you want a very short, very succinct, very powerful study of, exeg uh, of eschatology from an exegetical perspective, that is, let's dig into the text, let's ask who, what, when, where, why, and how, and let's determine what the Bible actually says about the nature of the coming of the Lord. I wrote this little book in Flaming Fire on a passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, that for years and years and years was my very favorite text to go to to prove a yet future coming of the Lord at the end of time. And yet, when I really, really, really began to look at the language, it was like, wait a minute. Proper hermeneutic uh, applied to this text will not allow that view. And a very quick anecdote here before I get into today's video in depth. <clears throat> the very first day in seminary on the, on the subject of 2 Thessalonians, our professor walked in. Now, here's a very erudite college professor, Ph.D., very, very good man. And he begins class like this. He goes, brethren, I have to tell you something. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 really gives me problems. And <clears throat> again, that text used to be one of my very, very favorite texts. You know, <clears throat> among preachers, there is a saying, well, you could really wax an elephant on that. And what we mean by that is you can wax eloquent on a given text. Well, I could really wax an elephant <laughs> on 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Well, so he said, this passage gives me all sorts of problems. And someone spoke up, I don't remember if it was me or not, and said, Brother Stewart, uh, why does this text give you problems? And he said, well, very simply, here's the problem. Paul was writing to the church at Thessalonian, Thessalonica 2,000 years ago. And they were being persecuted. There's no question about that from the text. The Greek of the text proves that beyond any shadow of a doubt. And Paul promised those people 2,000 years ago, they were going to get relief from that persecution, quote, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in flaming fire, unquote. And he said, now look, I know Jesus did not come in their lifetime and give them relief from that persecution. So he said, I want to tell you guys, this is troublesome. <clears throat> and he said, I want to challenge you to dig into this text and to determine, come to peace with it, make up your mind. How could Paul promise people 2,000 years ago who were being persecuted, and of course they were being persecuted by the Jews, by the way, and tell those people that they were going to get relief from that persecution at the coming of the Lord? Now, did Jesus come or did he not come? He said, I know Jesus didn't come, so this is a problem. You know what this is, ladies and gentlemen? This is the challenge of Christ. Remember what Jesus said? Do not believe me for my words' sake. Believe me for my works. If I do not do the works which my Father has given me, do not believe me. Well, here's Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, who is simply repeating the predictions of Jesus to come in the lifetime of that first century generation. And so Jesus' challenge must be applied to Paul's promise that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime in flaming fire to give them relief from that then ongoing persecution. 
Go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. Go to my store and order the book, In Flaming Fire. I wish that I could offer it to you postpaid, but I can't. I mean, the cost of the book is very, very inexpensive. Anyway, so take advantage of this little book. I want to, look, this little book has been used as a textbook on hermeneutic in Bible classes and in college courses. It's very, very powerful. So take advantage of that little book. Get a copy of it. You'll be glad that you did. And by the way, when you order a copy of it, just send me a little note that says, Hey, Don, I saw, I saw you talking about the book in Flaming Fire on Now TV. All right. So that's the challenge of Christ. We have been examining Isaiah chapters 2 through 5. Obviously, we're just in chapter 3. But we are examining Isaiah chapters 2 and following for the following reason. Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, which the huge majority of commentators say, well, you know, here is proof positive that the Bible predicts the end of time. Here is absolute positive proof that Jesus was going to come back when the earth is burnt up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Peter said that he was simply reminding his audience of what the old covenant prophets had to say about, number one, the last days, number two, the last days, day of the Lord, number three, when the Lord would come and destroy creation. That's Isaiah chapter 2, 19 to 21. I have, I have posed the question to you. I have challenged you to ask yourself the question, what Old Testament prophecy foretold the last days? Well, let's see. Isaiah 2, verse 2 and following. It shall come to pass in the last days. Okay? What Old Testament prophet foretold the last days, day of the Lord? Isaiah 2, 9 to 11. Isaiah 2, 19 to 21. The great day of the Lord, when the Lord arises to shake the earth mightily. Number three, the last days, day of the Lord, when the Lord would come to shake creation, to destroy creation. Well, again, Isaiah 2, 19 to 21. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 2, therefore, serves as the ground, the source, the fountain for 2 Peter chapter 3. But as I have shared with you repeatedly, and i got to hurry here, the day of the Lord of 2 Peter chapter 3 is a day of the Lord that men could escape from, could run from. Look, just the other day on, on Facebook, I asked the question, is the day of the Lord of Isaiah chapter 2 an end of time event or an end history event? There's a young fellow on there that, that seems to believe that he is God's gift to the world when it comes to eschatology and theology. <coughs> and he said, Isaiah chapter 2, 9 through 11, Isaiah 2, 19 to 21, that's the end of the time coming of the Lord. So when I came back and I said, well, if that's true, please explain to me how Isaiah could say that at, the day, at this day of the Lord, men could, <coughs> pardon me, run to the mountains. They could escape by hiding in the caves. Please explain that to me. After all, since Paul says the day of the Lord is a day of the Lord when, uh, you know, it's over in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Well, uh, you know, all of a sudden that young man totally, completely, absolutely, 100% abandoned that discussion. Uh, little reason why. He was entrapped. He knew he was entrapped. He couldn't, couldn't answer. Okay, with that said, I've been spending the last couple of weeks with you uh, on, uh, in Isaiah chapter 3 demonstrating that this day of the Lord of Isaiah chapters 2 through 4, 2 through 5, is in fact a historical day of the Lord. 
It is not and cannot be an end of time event. Very, very quickly as rehearsal, it would be a time in which the Lord will take away from Judah and from Jerusalem the store, the store and the stock of bread and of water. Folks, this is a judgment on Judah and Jerusalem in the last days. Oh, do you remember the challenge for those who say God was through with Israel at the cross, God was through with the Old Testament at the cross, uh, and the last days began on Pentecost, and beginning on Pentecost onward, God was not dealing with Israel, Old Co Covenant Israel, and not dealing with Old, Co Old Covenant Israel's promises found in the Old Testament at all, in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Uh, well, then how could Peter, be in 2 Peter 3, be anticipating the fulfillment of Isaiah, which is an Old Testament prophecy, obviously, dealing with Old Covenant Israel? You see the problem? If God was through with Israel at the cross, if God nailed the Old Covenant to the cross, then Peter should not be, in any way, shape, form, or fashion, be talking about the fulfillment of Isaiah 2 through 5. Because Isaiah 2 through 5 is talking about God's last day's dealings with Old Covenant Israel in fulfillment of Israel's Old Covenant promises. Do you see? This completely, totally falsifies the notion that God was through with Israel at the cross and that the old law was nailed to the cross. Now, back to our text. I shared with you last week, Isaiah chapter 3, 13 and 14. <clears throat> the Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his princes. You have eaten up my vineyard. Now, we didn't get to the very last statement here. You have eaten up my vineyard. Well, you see, in Isaiah chapter 5, we have a description <clears throat> not only of the sins of the leaders of Israel, and by the way, this is extrapolating forward because, you see, most commentators say, well, you see, Isaiah is dealing with the impending destruction, or excuse me, invasion of Israel at the hands of the Assyrians. Well, many chapters, pardon me, in Isaiah do deal with that. No question whatsoever about it. But here's a problem. Isaiah here is talking about the last days. Nowhere, listen to me, nowhere does Isaiah ever say he was living in the last days. Never. He is extrapolating to some far distant to him period of time in which it would be a judgment on Judah and Jerusalem. And you have to catch the power of what I'm about to share with you. Even though Assyria came into the land of Israel, and by the way, <clears throat> I was... Uh, tremendously privileged to travel to London and there to go into the British British Museum. Wow. Now, I'm, I'm a student of history. I, I absolutely love museums that have all of these exhibit, exhibits from history and what have you. I stood before a bas-relief. Now, a bas-relief is it, it's a sculpture in which the sculptor takes his tools and he chisels out around a, uh, a figure, a picture if you please, that he wants that figure to stand out. So he carves away the stone from around it, okay? That's a bas relief. Standing there in front of this sculpture, if I remember correctly, it's something like 26 feet long, from the period of time in which the Assyrians under Sennacherib invaded the land of Israel. Now, I want to tell you, this bas relief is absolutely incredible. It depicts, through means of what was known 
as a panegyric history. What is a panegyric? That's a big word. What is a panegyric history? Well, a panegyric history was a kind of history that was written in which the historian chronicles the actions and the life of a, of a given king, even governors, but mostly of kings and rulers. Now, if, uh, if by chance that king had run on to hard times, then the historian put roses on it. They sprinkled perfume on it. They did everything in their, in their ability to make it sound like this really bad time was somehow, some way, good news. Do you remember Baghdad, Bob, as the Americans were literally on the outskirts of Baghdad? We are winning a glorious victory. The Americans have been defeated. Right. That's a panegyric history, so to speak. So here is Sennacherib with his forces. Under, under his general, the Rab Shekab, that's a title, not a name. They come into Israel and they destroyed, literally destroyed, 46 cities. And this is all depicted on this bas relief. Oh, my goodness. The, the historian is, and the sculptor is singing the praises of Sennacherib and Rab Shekab. Given a prominent place in that bas relief is the siege of Lachish. Now, look, the Assyrian destruction of Lachish, it, it was phenomenal. Uh, oh, what a horrific event. And it depicts the Assyrians killing babies, impaling pregnant women of putting hooks, literally, oversized fish hooks, through the chest of men and women alike, leading them off into captivity. Others impaling them and hanging them up on the roads for all to see. That was the kind of warfare that the Assyrians waged. Well, here's the deal, and this is the point I'm getting to. This bas relief chronicles the utter destruction of 46 cities. And the, the, the Rabshakeh came up before the walls of Jerusalem. And he taunted the citizens of Jerusalem and Hezekiah the king. And he said, uh, you, surely you're not going to trust in, in your God, are you? Are you not aware that our gods have given the, the Egyptians into our hands? Are you not aware of how our gods have conquered the gods of everyone else? What makes you think your little god here in this little outpost of Jerusalem will be able to withstand us? And the Lord told Hezekiah through the prophet Isaiah, here's what you do. You don't, uh, you don't shoot an arrow. You don't throw a spear. You don't do anything. Now look, folks, there are 185,000 Assyrian soldiers, at least, camped outside the city. And the Lord is telling you, you trust in me. Don't shoot an arrow. Don't throw a spear. Everything's going to be okay. And you can read this in Isaiah 29 through 37. Hezekiah bowed the knee to the Lord. He trusted the Lord. And the angel of the Lord went through the camp of the Assyrians in one night and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Sennacherib went back to Nineveh, the capital city. There, <clears throat> he went back with his tail between his legs, utterly disgraced, utterly defeated. There, as he was worshiping his God, his sons killed him. Now, back to the bas relief. 
the chronicler comes to the time of the siege of Jerusalem. And he simply records that Sennacherib said, I destroyed 46 cities. I overwhelmed them like a flood and took them away. And I shut up the king of Jerusalem in a city like a bird in a key, cage. And I came back home. Of course, what he conveniently, conveniently did not tell his readers was, I lost 185,000 soldiers. I was whipped. I was defeated. So that panegyric does not give us, obviously, the full story. Now, I'm running out of time here, but what's the point? The point is that Isaiah chapters 2 through 5 are dealing with the restoration, a yet future, to them, last days, restoration, glorification of Jerusalem. Now listen to me. Jerusalem was not destroyed by the Assyrians. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians 130 some odd years later, if memory serves me correctly. But that was not the last days. And the events predicted in Isaiah chapters 2 through 5 did not occur, were not fulfilled, because how do I know that? Well, because the kingdom wasn't established there. Because uh, during that period of time, again, the kingdom was not established. God did not avenge the blood of his martyrs, as, as Isaiah chapter 4 verse 4 will tell us. And while there's commonality in some of the language, it is not ultimately fulfilled in the return from the Babylonian captivity. So, we will pick up on Isaiah chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 next week in the discussion of the elders eating up the vineyard of the Lord. I'll see you there.